The grace that I want to encourage us to ask for tonight and that I think the Lord wants to give is when you and I pray, we have an image in our mind of who we're talking to. Whatever that image is, it's wrong. It's way too small. So uh, I want to show, rather than give a talk, I want to play what I think is one of the most inspiring talks I've seen in a long time uh, by a guy named Louis Giglio. He's an evangelical pastor down in Atlanta. Some of you have seen this. Um, it's called How Great Is Our God? So we're going to show this. Uh, it's roughly the length of the talk, of a talk that we would give. Then we'll get into our small groups, spend some time in discussion, then we'll come back together for some Q&A. Um, but I don't want to waste uh, Louis' time. So if we can kill the lights, and Chris, if you can get us going. Um, Let's see if we can understand a little bit more who this God is who, oh, by the way, made the stars also. Uh, we're calling this, I think you knew this already, the How Great Is Our God Tour. Um, not just because God has given Chris this phenomenal song that circled the globe, but we're calling it the How Great Is Our God Tour because we are here tonight worshiping a God that is far beyond anything we could ever dream of or imagine. We are here tonight to worship a huge, massive God of grace and glory. If there's anything that could happen tonight, our heart is that we will leave tonight with at least a couple of things having happened to us, one being that our view of God will be completely blown up all over again, and that the view that we have of God will be expanded in this place tonight, and that we will leave here with the confidence that He is able to hold on to us and hold us together no matter what circumstances come our way in this lifetime. And if you were with us uh, on the indescribable tour, we sort of took a swing at that first part, looking at the bigness of God and the greatness of the universe. Anybody make it out to the indescribable tour, by the way, if you guys were there? The story of it in a nutshell was that the heavens are telling the glory of God. Their expanse declares the work of his hands. In other words, all you have to do is look up and you see the size of the God that we're worshiping tonight. We ended that. Just a little review. With this galaxy right here, the Whirlpool Galaxy, you're like, man, alive. We're talking about astronomy at a Christian worship service. Why not? The God that we're worshiping tonight is the one who created that right there. It's called the darling of astronomy. The reason why is it's sitting completely perpendicular to us on Earth, and when we look up at it, we get this beautiful view. But check this out. The Whirlpool Galaxy is 31 million light years away from where you're sitting right now. Okay, they got nothing in here tonight. 31 million light years away. That's just the first little thing we got to catch up with tonight. By the way, the story opens like this. In case you forgot, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. And that was a phenomenal moment when that happened because light came out of the mouth of God traveling 186,000 miles a second. That's how fast light is traveling through the universe. And so a light year, therefore, is how far light travels in one year. And I'll do the math for you. It's 5.88 trillion miles is a light year. So as we talked about before, when you start to get around in the neighborhood of God, the mile is not going to help you. The yardstick, the ruler, the tape measure, these things are of no value in the universe that God has made. We're using a ruler called a light year that's 5.88 trillion miles long. And if you'd like to go to the Whirlpool Galaxy, be my guest. All you have to do is multiply 31 million, that's how many light years it is away, by 5.88 trillion miles, and that's the distance that you've got to cover. A anybody with me so far? I'm, I'm wondering, are there any science lovers here tonight? Because we're going to have a little scientific content tonight, and I need to know if anybody's going to be with me so far. So you do the math, or you could look at it a different way. You just have to travel 186,000 miles a second for 31 million years, and voila, you will arrive at the Whirlpool Galaxy. Second thing that's pretty stunning, given that our God made that, is it contains 300 billion stars in that one galaxy, 300 billion stars. And it is one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies in the known universe that God has made. And it just reminds us all over again tonight, man, this God that we're singing to tonight, he's enormous. He's bigger than anything we've ever dreamed of. He's bigger than our wildest imagination of him. 
But we ended by looking inside that thing, and this is pretty stunning. Those of you who've seen it remember, but the Hubble Space Telescope is circling the Earth at 360 miles above the Earth, and it takes amazing images of these galaxies and other phenomenon of, of the cosmos, and it looked into that white core of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and lo and behold, there is a black hole in there. And we'd never seen it before until Hubble could take an image of it. And I found this on NASA's site, hubblesite.org. This is what Hubble sent back to us from 31 million light years away from the black hole core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. They send us back this image right here. And it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's the glory of God, the grandeur of God. It's the grace of God and the mercy of God everywhere we look. It's the imprint of God in all of creation, everywhere we turn. And tonight we just want to begin with the bigness of God, the, the grandeur of God all over again. We're going to do it by looking at four stars. Can, can you handle four stars tonight? The first one's easy because there's just one star in our solar system, and that star is called the... Sun, thank you very much. Yes, it's our own star. It's, uh, there's an image of it for you, by the way. It's a little more fierce than we often think. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, but what I want you to see about it is how big it is. It's 93 million miles away, so when you're looking up in the sky, it's pretty good pace out there. By the way, light traveling 186,000 miles a second, it's only taken eight minutes to cover that 93 million mile journey to touch your skin here in Atlanta, Georgia. But what I want you to see is the size of it. It's like a million times the size of the earth, and that matters to us tonight when you hear what the psalmist said. Listen to his words. By the word of the Lord, this is Psalm 33, the heavens were made. In other words, God didn't lift a finger when he made the universe. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. But he goes on to say, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. So we're looking at something so intense that we don't want to get any closer than 93 million miles away, which is what we are right now. And then we read that God just breathes out stars. It's crazy to think about it. A million times the size of the earth. So here's a little perspective that sort of changed my life. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, okay, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Okay, that didn't seem to move anybody either, so let me try it a different way. Let me just try it just a different way. I thought I might need this, so I brought a golf ball, okay? So all through the evening, this is going to represent Earth, all right? So this is where we are. I need everybody in the building to look as closely as you can and find yourself, okay? And when you've found yourself, I want you to nod your head so that I know you've located you on the Earth, okay? You're nodding your head? Okay, you found yourself. If the Earth were a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That's not 15 feet in diameter. Can we blow that up just a hair and maybe give them 15 feet in diameter? So here's a little perspective for you, okay? Is this working for anybody? Here we are on the Earth, and that's the sun. It's so big. It's so big, you could put... 960,000 Earths inside the sun. So if the Earth were a golf ball and the, and the sun were 15 feet in diameter, you could put 960,000 golf balls inside that 15 foot in diameter sun. That's enough golf balls, by the way, because I know that seems like a big number, to fill a school bus with golf balls could fit inside the 15 foot in diameter sun. It's a massive star and it's one of hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, our cul-de-sac in the neighborhood called the cosmos that God has made. It's huge and we're worshiping a star breathing God tonight. But I want to tell you about the second star, okay? Because the second star absolutely wrecked my life. I heard about it when I was a high school student here in Atlanta. One of our youth leaders did a talk, and he mentioned this star. I didn't know how to talk to God for about two months after I heard about this star. It's called Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. You can pick your pronunciation. I'm obviously going with Betelgeuse, and Betelgeuse is incredible. Here it is in the night sky. I know it doesn't look incredibly ferocious but it's 427 light years away. So that's 427 times 5.88 trillion miles away from us right now. Draw it in a little closer with the Hubble Space Telescope and you can start to get a little bit of the feeling of its intensity, but this is the crazy thing about Betelgeuse. Are you ready for this? Betelgeuse is twice the size. Are you ready? You think I'm gonna say twice the size of the sun? Oh no, it's twice the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun, Betelgeuse is. It's crazy. If the earth were a golf ball, 
Beetlejuice would be the height of six Empire State Buildings on top of each other. No, come on, have you seen the Empire State Building? <laughs> I mean, maybe what you're going to need to do is gather the family, get a golf ball, get some plane tickets, and fly up to New York. And you're going to go into Midtown, you're going to take your golf ball and put it on the sidewalk outside the Empire State Building. Don't worry about people thinking you're crazy. They're not even going to notice you in New York. You're going to go across the street. You're going to look up at the Empire State Building and imagine five more Empire State Buildings on top of the Empire State Building. That's Beetlejuice, and that's the earth, and somewhere you're on it. You could fit 262 trillion earths inside Beetlejuice. So if the earth were a golf ball, that would be enough golf balls to fill up the Superdome with golf balls 3,000 times. <laughs> when I heard that as a teenager, that stumped me right there. Because most of my praying had been advising God, correcting God, <laughs> suggesting things to God, drawing diagrams for God, <laughs> reviewing things with God, counseling God. The third star, let's just, can you go a little bit bigger with me? The third star is called Musifi. Here it is in the night sky. It's that gold star to the top left. We, we have the big image of it. It's 3,000 light years away, but I just want you to see it in the, in the span of all these little glittering stars so that you know that at times when you look up at night, it is not just twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I'm telling you what you are. What you are is intense and huge and massive and ferocious is what you are. And, and this one used to be called Herschel's Garnet Star. Check it out. If the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Musifi would be the width of two Golden Gate bridges end to end. Apparently, you're going to need to go from New York to the West Coast. Go to San Francisco with your family and your golf ball. Place your golf ball at the beginning of the Golden Gate Bridge. Go across the bay into Oakland to a high place where you can see the entire Golden Gate Bridge. Another second Golden, break, go, Golden Gate Bridge will be in your imagination. Span all the way back the two Golden Gate Bridges to the very beginning and find your golf ball over there. That's the earth and somewhere you're on it. One of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's so big you could fit 2.7 quadrillion earths inside this one star. Thank you so much. Where have you been all night? Now, quadrillion we have not talked about, and I need to explain this just briefly because I don't know about you, but I do not understand the national debt or any numbers bigger than about $875.28. I get that number. Go bigger than that, I don't know. But you need to understand a quadrillion, okay, because this star is crazy big. A quadrillion, uh, let's do it this way. Everybody knows a million, right? How many of you know what a million is? You can kind of get your head around a million. Everybody? All right. You know that a billion's a thousand million, and a trillion is a thousand billion, and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion, right? Everybody knew that? Here's the perspective. This changed my life, right? A million seconds ago, 12 days ago. Isn't that cool? See, that saves you doing that on your little calculator at home, which I dare you to try to do when you get home tonight. <laughs> but a billion seconds ago? You're thinking, oh my goodness, if it's 12 days ago, I'm going all the way back to like September with you, Louie. This must be crazy, right? How about May 1975 is a billion seconds ago. You're like, whoa, that's a little bit bigger than a million. Oh, yeah. A trillion seconds ago, you're like, uh-huh, I'm on the 1800s. No. Christopher Columbus? No. 29,700 B.C. is a trillion seconds ago. A quadrillion seconds ago, 30,800,000 years ago is a quadrillion seconds ago. We're talking about a really large number, and Musifi is so big, you could put 2.7 quadrillion Earths inside this one star. But it is not even the biggest star we have found. I love science, and science has just brought us the largest star they found. It's called, are you ready for this, Canis Majoris. Now, I'm no linguist, but that's a cool name for the biggest star we've found so far. I think that means the big dog star, and that's exactly what it is. 
I bring it to you as a little bitty purple, you know, glow just to the right of center there. But Canis Majoris, oh wow, if the earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Canis Majoris would be the height of Mount Everest. Thank you. You just saved your family plane fare from California to Kathmandu, Nepal. Almost six miles above sea level, the highest point on the planet, and I just dare you to get up there and unzip the parka and pull out your golf ball. You could fit seven quadrillion Earths inside Canis Majoris. That's enough Earths if the Earth were a golf ball to cover the entire state of Texas in golf balls 22 inches deep. You see the one you're on? Maybe this will help a, a little bit more. This absolutely blew my mind. Just a little journey through our solar system. Everyone knows our planets and sort of how we fit in to the story here. You see really quickly that we're not even the biggest deal in our own solar system, but as Earth comes by, you have to know tonight that we are living on a privileged planet. Anyone would tell you we're living at one of the most special places, if not the most special place in all of creation. But Neptune comes by and Saturn and then Jupiter and you're like, okay, we're not all that big, even in our own little cul-de-sac. I just noticed the blue dot fading away is not the earth. That's Neptune. The earth has gotten too small to see anymore. Sirius comes by, little plug for satellite radio. Not the biggest star, but the brightest star that we have found so far. Pollux, which we didn't mention, Arcturus. Such a beautifully named one, Regal. But then the one that messed me up. Our third star, Musifi. Musifi's cousin, W. Sifi. And Canis Majoris. And do you know that you couldn't come up here right now with a Sharpie? and make a mark on the screen that would approximate the size of our sun, you couldn't even do it. I mean, when you look at these and their relative size, we just have to put a little arrow over there that says, if you could put the sun on here, which you can't, it would go somewhere about here. And um, can you hang on that for me? And when you see this, I don't know what happens to you, but I'll tell you what happens to me. A shrinking feeling comes over me, and it's not a bad shrinking feeling, it's a good shrinking feeling. Because sin, it has a, a way of shrinking God down in our minds and puffing us up in our own estimation. But just a glance into the universe that God has made resizes everything in a heartbeat. And you realize tonight we are worshiping an unrivaled, uncontested God of all kind of might and power and glory and awe who is, there's none like Him anywhere in all of creation tonight. We are not here worshiping some little teeny tiny God. We are the teeny tiny ones, you and me. We are small and weak and fragile and frail. We are, you and me tonight, one of six and a half billion people on this little golf ball sized planet in this massive universe that God has made. But I'll tell you the miracle of tonight is, is crazy and crazier to me than the size of any star, is that though we are but a vapor, you and me, 
and tiny and frail. We are marked by majesty. And we have been created in the very image of the God who breathes out the stars and put the universe into place. You and I are fashioned and formed and ordained by the God of all creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, you and I. We are a miracle. You're a miracle sitting in the building tonight. If I could just remind you just for a moment, you are somebody incredibly special. Let me just dial back to the beginning, and I, I know you know this already, but in the very, very beginning, here's how you happened, okay? One cell from your mom found one cell from your dad. Now, there's more involved in that than that, but that's enough for us right now. And by the way, we should applaud the one cell from your dad because that one cell did a pretty heroic thing to be the one cell in the story that we're talking about tonight. One cell from your mom met up with one cell from your dad, each one carrying 23 chromosomes. The one from your mom was carrying half of her DNA. The one from your dad was carrying half of his DNA. And those two cells met and merged into one single cell. And when they did, those chromosomes matched, and they began to form together a brand new DNA code using four characters, four nucleotides. They began to write out what we have now discovered is the three billion character description of who you are written in the language of God. They wrote out your DNA, your human genome of three billion characters made up of those four simple nucleotides. And when they did, they described who God had ordained you to be. In that one little simple cell, scientists say if you took the DNA out of that one little cell and stretched it out, that DNA would be six feet long, three billion characters stretched out to six feet long. So amazing that if I were to read your DNA, reading one character per second, night and day, it would take me 96 years just to read the description of you. And when they formed together, they wrote out and painted a picture which had never been written before in the history of humankind. And then that cell did the unthinkable. It set out to build that model from one cell. I'm telling you, you are a miracle sitting in this building tonight. And you have come a long, long way. I mean, here you are. This may not be in the family photo album, but here you are <laughs> at three days old. Sixteen cells of you. You say, what in the world is that? It's a 16-cell human embryo on the tip of a safety pin at incredible magnification. So by now, that one cell had turned into 16 cells on its way to making the 75 trillion cells that make up your body tonight. Every one of those 75 trillion cells containing that six feet of the three billion character DNA code that you. There's so much DNA in your body, by the way. If you stretched it all end to end, there'd be enough DNA to go to the moon and back inside your body. 178,000 times. That's how amazing God has made you to be. 75 trillion cells in your body. And when I told you that, 50,000 of those cells died and were replaced by brand new cells when I told you that. And then just now, 50,000 more cells died and were replaced by brand new cells. It's happening every three seconds, day and night, all the days of your existence. And you wonder why you're tired all the time. I'll tell you, you're doing some amazing stuff night and day. We're miracles, you and me. I love the way Augustine said it, one of the great fathers of the church and of the faith. He just nailed it when he said it like this. Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the long course of rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motion of the stars, 
but they pass by themselves and they don't even notice. In the womb, miracles happening every moment. Here you are at five months in the womb. You remember those days, those were the good old days. <laughs> and just miracles happening every second. Let me tell you about one. Million optic nerve endings left the optic nerve center of your brain in the womb, headed for a million optic nerves that had left your eye. And they had to meet and match their exact partner, one million looking for one million. And when they found their exact partner out of a million and matched up together, in that instant you had sight. And anyone would tell you that to this moment, the most technologically advanced thing on planet Earth is your eye. Oh, but it didn't do you any good because when that moment happened, you just had one piece of skin completely covering your eyeball. But as I read in one textbook, miraculously and mysteriously at about the sixth month, a little cutting device appeared and it cut perfectly that piece of skin. And you had eyelids for the very first time in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the God of the heavens is the one who fashioned you together. And he knows your name tonight. And he knows every single thing there is to know about you and he's made you a promise that for those who trust in him he will literally hold them in his hand and carry them all the days of their life this Psalm 33 that talks about a star breathing God turns an interesting corner it says for he spoke and it came to be he commanded and it stood fast. That's power and awe. But now it gets very personal. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of them all and is intimately acquainted with everything they do. And then he goes even further. And he says the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those who hope in his unfailing love, and here comes his promise, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. And that is the promise tonight because this building and our world is filled with hurting people, with lives that are spinning out of control, with pain that we, don't, we didn't ask for or could never imagine. And God is making a promise to us tonight. He's saying, I am a universe maker and I am a heart former, but I'm also big enough to be intimately acquainted with all the circumstances of every one of your lives. And I promise you, no matter what comes in this lifetime, no matter how difficult the road or how dark the night, I will hold on to you and I will literally hold you together Together and carry you through any and every circumstance that ever comes your way any moment on this planet. It's the promise of God. And you say, well, man, that sounds good, but how do I know that's true in my life right now, Louis? I mean, that's really what we want to know tonight. And I'll tell you how you can know tonight that God will always hold you together no matter what. It's by looking a little deeper into the human body and it's a little protein molecule called laminin. Yeah, that's about what I felt the first time I heard that. <laughs> Long story short, the tour was winding down last time around. We were in Tyler, Texas. The night was over. A guy walks up to me. I wish I could tell you the whole story. It was so of God introduces himself to me, says, how are you doing? I just want to say hello. I said, it's nice to meet you. He says, you guys winding the tour down. Uh, where are you going to go from here? I said, well, I'm on my way back home to Atlanta, Georgia. 
He said, well, what's next for you? I said, I'm going to be preaching the next two Sundays for my pastor back in Atlanta. He said, oh, cool. What are you preaching on? I said, well, the series is on the glory of God in the human body. He said, that's really amazing. I'm a molecular biologist at the university down the road. G give me your talk. And I was like, oh, wow. I wasn't quite yet ready to unload the talk for a molecular biologist. So I kind of stumbled through what I had, and he's kind of being kind and gracious and like, uh-huh, that's good. And then he says, well, what's your big left hook? You got to have a left hook, a big finish, right? I said, I don't have a left hook yet. He said, oh, Louie. Oh, man, your left hook is laminin. And I'm, I'm totally blank on laminin. He goes, Louie, it's a cell adhesion molecule, protein molecule. Do you know about proteins? I'm like, no. He said, Louie, cells organize into certain molecular structures, and that determines what protein there are. There are between 10 and 60,000 proteins in the human body. We don't even know how many proteins are in the human body. But one of them is a cell adhesion molecule. It's organized into this certain structure, and that tells the cell what its job is in the body. And this one is a cell adhesion molecule. And I'm like, all right. He said, no, Louis. it's like the rebar of the human body. The steel they put in the concrete when they lay the foundations of things, it's that stuff. It's, it's holding your membranes together. It's the glue of the human body, Louis. It's laminin. You've got to tell them about laminin. And I'm like, I promise you, I'm going home and tell them about laminin. And I'm sure when I do, revival is going to sweep across the church and probably around the world when I tell them. He said, no, 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 no. You've got to see laminin. I'm like, okay, let's see it. He said, no, 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 you need to go look it up online. You need to go Google laminin. I'm like, I don't even know how to spell laminin. <laughs> Takes his card out, he writes on the back, L-A-M-I-N-I-N. -I -I I'm like, okay, I cannot wait to get to my computer and get on Google, click on images, type in laminin, and I'm waiting, and these little thumbnails come up on the screen, and I'm like, That's laminin, the cell adhesion molecule. Woo! <laughs> I am so excited. I am beside myself. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I love laminin. I'm so fired up. <laughs> you should see laminin, I guess. That's the thing, right? Okay. Here is a scientific diagram of the laminin cell adhesion molecule that's holding your body together right now, okay? This is what I found right here. No, come on, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just crazy. I'm, I just can't believe it. I emailed that guy back so fast, I'm like, wow, 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 what in the world? He said, you want to see an actual laminin molecule? I'm like, oh, no, man. The diagram was cool for me. I'm happy with that. Don't, don't bother sending anything else. I'm like, yes! And he sends me this image, an electron microscopic image of an actual laminin protein molecule. It looks just like this. Like how crazy is that? That the stuff that holds our bodies together, that's holding the lining of your organs together, holding your skin on, is in the perfect shape of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately I'm thinking about the words of Paul in Colossians 1. You know this beautiful passage where Paul's talking about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He says, for by him, talking about Jesus Christ, all things have been created, things in heaven and things on earth. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. But then the next verse goes on to say this. It's crazy. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him, that is, in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. It's right, it's right there. I'm like, of course they do. Of course they do. Everything holds together in Jesus Christ. And he goes on at the end of this paragraph 
And he just tells the story of grace. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. And through Christ to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. So you're at the toughest place in your life. How can you know that God is going to hold you together and bring you through? You know because there is a cross standing over history and it is looming over this building tonight. It is the place where the star breather became the sin bearer. Where the universe maker became mankind's savior. And it is proof that God doesn't always change the circumstances. He did not change them for Jesus on that hillside outside Jerusalem. But the cross is also proof that God always has a purpose in the circumstances and that his purpose and his plan will prevail and will triumph through any circumstances in this world. And so we just close with this question. It's found right in the middle of an interesting chapter in Isaiah 40 where it just talks about the expanse of God. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, like a tent to dwell in. He leads forth the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. But then it takes a turn. And the writer of Isaiah says, So why do you say, O Jacob? And why do you complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. Or say, my cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, there was a moment in the history of Israel when they felt like God had completely lost sight of them. That yes, I believe that God is big enough to make the world. I even believe that God ordained and made me. And now coming present tense, I will accept the fact that God gave his son on a cross. But what I really need to know right now, what really matters most to me right now, is does God see what I'm going through? Does he see what I'm carrying? Does he know that I can't take one more step or one more day? Does he care and can he do something? That's what I need to know. And Isaiah answers and he answers with another question. And it's a question for us here. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He's huge. He is a star breather. He's big. But listen to what he loves to do. That God, that creator of the ends of the earth, that I do not grow tired or weary, that my understanding is too great for you, that God, here's what he does. He gives strength to the weary. And he increases the power of the weak. For even the youths will grow tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, another translation, those who wait upon the Lord. The Hebrew word simply means this. When it says hope and wait, it means but those who stand right in the midst of the craziness, right in the midst of the pain, right in the midst of the chaos, right in the valley of the shadow of death, and they don't gloss over it. They're dealing with the hardest stuff in life, but standing in the middle of it, they say, you know what? I don't see what God's doing. I don't understand what the plan is, but I'll tell you one thing. I am not going to give up on God, and I'm going to stand right here in the middle of this moment, and I'm going to trust that God is sitting on a throne, that he has a purpose for my life and a plan for my life. And I believe I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I'm not going to stop believing that no matter what. That's what the word means, to wait and to hope on the Lord. And he said, and here's the promise. You're going to wake up to rosy circumstances. No. No. Oh, he can do that and he does do that. But the promise is greater than that. He said, those who wait upon the Lord, here's what I promise. I will 
renew your strength. And when you think you can't take one more breath, I'll give you enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on. And to keep going. And to keep going. And to keep going. You keep hoping and I'll keep causing strength to rise when you hope. And you'll keep going. And you'll feel like you have been swept up on the wings of eagles. And you will run and not get weary. And walk through it all. And not faint. He said, I will hold you. Even when you let go of me, I'm not going to let go of you. Do you know there are millions and millions and millions of microscopic crosses holding you together right now? And one giant glorious cross of Jesus Christ that's holding every one of us that's trusted in him on to the heavenly father and holding the heavenly father on to us and it's going to keep holding us onto him that cross forever and ever and ever and ever we will never not be carried by the strong hand of a universe making God and he will bring us through that is the promise of the everlasting God God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. So here's the golf ball. And it's actually got the earth painted on it. So we're going to um, break into groups uh, to talk in just a sec. Um, let me just say one thing. We, we've shown this several times. To We've used it as a retreat for the... Uh, parish staff, and, uh, and I watch it um, pretty frequently. Here's what's always in my mind every time I watch this. So the one who made this um, massively immense universe is on his knees with a towel wrapped around his waist. Washing Judas's feet. Or he's allowing himself to be judged by some clown named Pilate. Or he's allowing these itty bitty creatures that we are who have rejected his offer of friendship to press into his head thorns. And he allows this. Because you matter. I, I watch something like that and I just keep thinking, I have no idea what love is. If the creature that I made in my own image and likeness, and I'm that big, doesn't fall, we're going to see this in a couple of weeks, but rebels and revolts, I'm starting over again. But God didn't. God humbles himself to become like us this one who made a universe that is just beyond anything you can imagine. And here right now, the whole point of doing everything that we're doing and rerouting, huh? this, is, this is the point. The point is, how are you and I going to respond to a God who's this big, who willingly chooses this and now invites to surrender? Because remember, that, that's the agenda. We said that early on in, in week three. What's God's agenda here? What does he want? That's what he wants. He wants you and me to surrender. 
and to watch something like this and to understand the majesty of the one who's asking us to surrender and the power of the one who's asking us to surrender and the love of the one who's asking us to surrender, what in the world would keep you and me back? But that's the goal. That's the whole point of this. So, for example, when Isaiah sees a vision of heaven or John sees a vision of heaven, their favorite word is like. And then I saw something that looked like gold. It wasn't gold. It looked like gold. Why is he saying that? Because I don't know anyone else to describe this to you. I'm trying to find something that you and I have seen that might be helpful in describing something which is literally beyond description, right? Um, it was the second reading last week at Mass on Sunday. Um, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. It has not even dawned on man what God has prepared for us. So um, being divinized is, uh, is all of that. To be in the image and likeness of God, does that mean being versus doing? Um, we certainly put too much emphasis on doing versus being. Um, but God does things too, right? Jesus says, my father is always at work. And he watches what the Father does, and he does what he does. So I think our challenge is, th this is, I can only speak to it as a man. Um, but you see it a lot when people retire. I feel useless. I don't, I don't have any meaning anymore. I'm not doing anything. And I got no purpose. Because I've equated my purpose with what I did all those years happens when someone begins to suffer. Now I can't do anything anymore. So I'm useless and valueless. You might as well just end it. When in fact, um, that's just not true. Um, one's value has nothing to do with what, what one can do. In fact, this is actually the most active moment in Jesus' life. Even though it doesn't look like he's doing anything. But this is the most active moment of his life. He's saving the world right there. Which all of a sudden gives a whole new meaning to suffering of whatever kind when suffering comes our way. Uh, why did God create man? You can't answer the question with the question that I asked. I asked that question. <laughs> I mean, come on. See me after class. <laughs> you will repeat the third grade. Um, someone tell, why did God create man? We got... Yeah, because he willingly chose to bring me into existence out of nothing, right? He made me for friendship. Take, I'd take out man and put you there. Why did, why did God create John? out of love, for friendship, to be divinized, to know me. First, to be loved, then to love. It's that order. That's really important. Why did God create us on earth? Why not create us in heaven with him? That is not something that I can answer. Sorry. <laughs> Ask him. Jesus said, on that day when you get home, you won't have any questions. <laughs> Until then, we got a lot of questions, and some of them, you just kind of go, I don't know. I have no idea the answer to that. Um, Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suited to him. If women are meant to be equal companions to men, why are they referred to as helper, subject, server to man? Great question. That's this Sunday. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> See, here's, in all honesty, here's one of the things that I hope, um, I hope especially for my sisters, uh, will happen, but not just for them. Particularly, f uh, particularly for marriage, right? The moment that we begin to realize that the scriptures are not out of touch, 
So the moment I understand the correct meaning of that word in Hebrew, ezer, helper, and what it does and doesn't mean, everything changes and you go, oh, well, I didn't know that. And then what happens? What happens is now all of a sudden I see the Bible as the valuable guide to marriage again. If I think that the scriptures are the enshrinement of um, a patriarchal worldview where women are held as chattel, then I'm not going to look at this. And if I'm not going to look at this, where am I going to look? And I'm going to be lost. But if I understand that the God who's speaking in scripture is not dated, and he doesn't have the worldview that oftentimes we think that we project onto it, then all of a sudden I begin to understand, oh, so that text and Ephesians 5 turn out to be the most remarkably beautiful things ever revealed about marriage. I just never learned it. I heard so-and-so in a women's studies program at such and such a secular university tell me, or a Catholic university, even worse, tell me mm, when mm, was wrong. So we're going to get into all that. But, I, but again, a, a real hope that I have, like, so I see Tony over there. Where are you, Tony? I just saw you. So Tony's starting, a, when are you starting the scripture study in Ephesians? April. So April. So some of you have gone through some of the Bible studies that Tony's led, and everybody comes back and they just rave. Tony's a great uh, facilitator and teacher, so we're gifted to have him here in the parish. So we're going to get done with rerouting, you know, at Easter. Tony's starting a scripture study in Ephesians, which would be a great thing for some of us who want to get into something more, just to kind of dive into. And Ephesians, um, you know, that's that famous text, wives, and then it gets butchered in the different translations. Um, be submissive, obey, uh, be subordinate, whatever, to your husbands. And everybody goes, I mean, this is just stupid, right? And you throw it out the window. I, I know people who have ripped that page out of their Bible and said about it, this, um, this has no hold on us. Well, then what are you left with, right? Because their, their perception is, this is just really offensive. When the reality is, um, once you learn what it's saying and what it's not saying, it's not offensive at all. We're going to get into that next week. So I hope the scriptures become something that we just feel like we can turn to with greater confidence and we can scratch our heads and go, you know, like someone once said, the only way you read scripture is on your knees as opposed to at a desk. What we want to do is we read the scriptures. When we have a problem, we go, see, something's wrong here. When, when, if I don't understand the text, I should realize I must not be getting it so you, it should drive us to go study and to ask questions and to pray. Does that make sense? You know? I'll give you an example. Um, like um, St. Jerome, who's the patron saint of scripture scholars, th there's a story about him when he would translate Paul. So Jerome's translating the Greek into Latin. So if you've ever read a Greek New Testament, if you've ever read Greek, ancient Greek. There's no punctuation. It's just mm, you know, like, well, where does this stop? Is that an exclamation point? Is that a question mark? What's going on here? So Jerome used to say to Paul as he's translating, Paul, you don't want to be understood. If anybody's ever lectured and you've ever read Paul, like especially Ephesians, there's whole paragraphs which in Greek are one sentence. You know, it's kind of like a reading from the letter to the Colossians. And then, so it's difficult. And at times as you're reading it, it's supposed to, like, the Lord's trying to make us chase sometimes. He's trying to provoke us. He says things that make you go, what? Example, um, Gospel of John, I think it's John 5. Man comes to Jesus his son's sick, or his servant's sick, S comes to him and says, Lord, my servant's sick, will you come and heal him? 
Anybody remember Jesus' response? He says, unless you people see signs, you will never believe. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I go, huh? Like, what kind of answer is that? And the man looks at Jesus and says, sir, please, my son is dying. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. And he does. That's a text that's supposed to drive you into prayer. You're supposed to go, sit before the Lord and go, I don't understand this. I know your love. I know everything you do is love. That doesn't look like a loving response. I know the problem must be with me. I need some help. So help. And then the Lord gives clarity as you pray with that. Or the, Samar the Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus and asks for her daughter to be healed. Remember that story? And Jesus, in one text, doesn't even look at her. He just says, it is not right to give the food for the children to the dogs. And you go, um. And so people try to go, well, the Greek word there is for a, f a little domestic puppy. Like, that helps, right? Like, give me a break. Oh, I'm a domestic puppy. Oh, I thought I was some wild beast in the yard. Like, give me a break, right? Like, that's supposed to make me feel better? But it's supposed to drive you to prayer. And you're supposed to wrestle with the Lord and go, I don't understand what you're saying. And he will enlighten us. And then you start doing commentaries. It's why there are volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of commentary. So, so those of you who are, you know, everything from engineers to physicians and specialists of whatever kinds, and you have libraries that you use, so we have libraries for Scripture, because that's what we are. We're specialists in Scripture. And, and we want, you know, so like I get hurt and I go, I don't know, my arm hurts. What's wrong? You know, the doctor's like able to know it right away because he knows how the arm works. I don't. I just know it hurts. Right? So we're all, many of us, unfortunately, we're just biblically illiterate. We really are. And on top of that, we're reading with 21st century American eyes another culture from another time where they write very differently and their interests are not ours. And the Lord uses them. So a, a number of the questions just have to do with how do I, like the, the, the simplified common question would be, like how do I read scripture, especially these early parts of Genesis, because is it true or is it not true? And so we, we published in the, um, in the paper, and I think John's got a link on, to Dei Verbum. Dei Verbum is the single most important document to read on how to read the scriptures. It's not very long. Dei Verbum is the word of God in Latin. One of the four major documents from Vatican II, particularly how to read um, scripture and the Old Testament are very important and worth reading. And they're only a few paragraphs long, and it's just spend some time in it as we keep going through Genesis. Because unlike, so um, some religions believe that God dictates things. So like some of us even have, some of us have the painting in our house of St. Matthew. Here's the angel. Who is it? Is it Rennie? Um, Guido Rennie, I think, is the artist. So, you know, here's Matthew. He's in this beautiful flowing robe. He's got this fountain pen. Probably not a fountain pen. Angel right here. And he's like, okay. And then what? All right. 5,000, you say, okay. Huh, huh. <laughs> the next, a week later, okay. And pilot, all right. And that's how we think. Like the, the, the evangelists are just taking dictation from God. That's not how scripture is communicated. They're not, they're not taking dictation from an angel. They're using all sorts of other sources, oral, t oral traditions which are floating around, eyewitness accounts, um, their own genres, styles, manners of speech. But see, here's a problem. So we go, ah, oral tradition. How reliable is that, right? Because 
we all grew up playing the telephone game. So I'm going to tell a story to Mary and Chris over there, and by the time it goes all the way around the room and it gets over to Carrie, <laughs> totally different story, right? And we learned that. Like, we learned that in kindergarten. I remember that in kindergarten. And the point of the teacher was, you can't trust what other people say. <laughs> An oral culture would look at you and go, wait a minute, from there to there, you guys couldn't remember the same story? What's wrong with you? Like, how stupid are you? Why? Because we have this incredible bias towards writing. Most of the world is illiterate. They still know how to get along. Villages in the Middle East, villages in Africa have still to this day huh, someone who has the particular responsibility of passing on those stories which are treasures of that town or that village. They would never think of somehow forgetting it, of altering it. it would, it's incomprehensible to them. But see, we're a written culture, and so we have all these biases that we project onto all oh, those people from long ago. Like, they're just kind of stupid. Like, they didn't really know what they were doing. That's why I love taking people over to Rome. We take youth over to Rome, and all of a sudden they go, wow, these people were kind of smart. Like, there's the Colosseum. It's almost 2,000 years old. It's still standing. Two world wars, barbarian invasions, earthquakes, fires, disasters, looting. We don't play in the Silverdome anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> Questionable as we, as we did, right? That's probably the comment. <laughs> So, I mean, you, you, you go overseas, right? Or you, you go to Pompeii or you go to Herculaneum. First century Rome, or first century Roman suburb, you know, like hours away, it's not a suburb, but it's another town. Everything's covered in volcanic ash, indoor plumbing, copper pipes. Unbelievable frescoes. It's all still there. Drive through Detroit. <laughs> I mean it. Just because they didn't have the internet doesn't mean they were stupid. They just didn't have the internet. My brother-in-law lived in uh, Egypt for a dozen years. We used to go out to the pyramids. He's an engineer. They have no idea how they made those. They're 5,000 years old. We couldn't make one of those. They just move them all around. Boom, up goes an obelisk. Up goes a sphinx. We couldn't do that stuff. They did it all the time. So they weren't stupid. And these are the people who are telling us gospel accounts, passing on stories of creation, whatever. So we, we have to be really careful that we don't just think because they didn't write, they're not reliable. That's an incredible prejudice on our part. And they would think that we're the ones who are actually um, to be pitied because we can't even remember a simple story. I mean, how sad. I gotta have a text to remember because our memories aren't used the way their memories are used. So we want to make sure that we read the scriptures with an understanding of how we're supposed to read the scriptures, that they're not taking dictation, that they're, um, the Lord is using them as genuine um, uh, authors. And he's communicating through them. And so that's why things are you know, written in particular ways. David has a particular style when he writes the Psalms. Solomon has a particular style. Paul has a style. Matthew has a style. Luke has a style. When you read them and you start looking at them, you just, like some of us use the Magnificat for daily devotion. Huh? Anybody do that? Any of you, like, as soon as you start reading the first paragraph, like, I automatically know, oh, that's, that's Alfred Delp, I think. You turn the page, sure enough, it's Delp. 
you know, or I think that's Romano Guardini, turn a page, it's Guardini. That looks like Sheen. Boom, you just start to recognize people's touch and how they write, you know? So if you are familiar enough with the scriptures, you just recognize something similar. This is Paul, I can tell. This is how Paul writes. These are the things that are passionate to his heart. And the Lord's using that to communicate. Is that understandable to people? Yeah. So Dave Arabin is a really, really um, worthwhile um, document to read. I would keep it really handy as we keep going through Genesis. Um, the rest of these I'll, um, I'll try to take on, um, we'll put them on the, um, the video. Oh, there's one question on evolution. Huge question, actually. Um, how does one reconcile the creation stories with evolutionary theory and the fossil record? Um, there, the church has no problem with evolution. We need to distinguish what we mean by evolution. So there's Darwinian evolution and there's our evolution. Darwinian evolution is not evolution. Darwinian evolution is a philosophy. Or it's not, I should say, it's not science or it's not pure science. There's a philosophy behind it. It's trying to make statements beyond what science can say. And to know Darwin and to know who Darwin's influenced by and what Darwin's trying to get to is worth doing a little research on. So science can only answer how things are happening. But there's no ability to answer the why. Pope Benedict, in a, um, in a really short essay that he wrote um, in a book called, I think it's Credo for Today, talks about um, how do we reconcile these things. And I think the way he puts it, this is not an exact quote, but it's something to this sense, which has always been very helpful for me. He says, the moment that this being, so pre presuppose evolution for a moment, because if that happens. Because the church would say, fine, you show me that it happened scientifically, I'll go with it. How do you know it's man, humanity? And Benedict says, the creature is human when the creature is able to be in dialogue with God. The moment that happens, now we're talking about a human being. Before that, whatever that was, wasn't human. That's if that's able to be shown scientifically. That's how the church would respond to something like that. As Al Cresta puts it, the, the contrast is not between creation and evolution. The contrast is between creation and chaos. Because those who want to argue against creation want to argue that there's no point. That's not science. That's, a, that's an acceptable position to hold, but it's not science. That's a philosophy. So make an argument. That's what's got to happen. Does that make sense, people? Yeah? Okay. So we'll, we'll take some of these other ones and uh, try to answer them on the videos that, um, that John makes. So this coming week, we're going to dive into... Um, uh, Genesis 2, and we're going to continue to look more deeply at what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God, and we're going to set up the fall um, by talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and what that means. So, because uh, that too causes lots of confusion. In the meantime, go home, find a golf ball. <laughs> find yourself on it. <laughs> and then imagine this like one of, except it's really the size of the earth, and there's seven quadrillion of them inside a star. And the one who made that has you in his hands like this, and he knows everything that's going on in your life. And he's telling you, don't be afraid. Because I, God, am never nervous, I'm never anxious. I have a plan for you. I'm never too busy with what's going on in the Middle East to take care of you. I can handle everything. Just come to me and trust me. So let's pray that he'll do that. Huh? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father, we do ask that you would give us an increase of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you would be generous in pouring him out upon all of us here tonight. Especially as we reflect on uh, what it is that we've watched that we might have a greater sense of your majesty and your power, your splendor and your goodness, and that we would simply be awed by the fact that you know us by name, 
that we don't need to tell you what's going on or any of our concerns. You know them all. And that you love us more than we could ever hope or dare to imagine. So let that reality be the means of us sleeping tonight in peace as we surrender ourselves and all those that we love into your loving and merciful hands, for you are our good Father. And we make this prayer as we do always in Jesus' name. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thanks, everybody.